It's the Craggy Rugby Podcast. I'm Rob Murphy. Another down week for provincial rugby from a Connacht perspective, but we are making podcasts every week for you during these COVID times while you're locked at home. We want to make sure that you get some entertaining rugby from a Connacht perspective. That's the idea anyways. Big weekend for Six Nations, of course, and a big weekend just gone. So we'll talk about some of the fallout from the Ireland-Wales game and we'll uh, discuss what's to come for Ireland in that regard, but very much with our Connacht glasses on as well in the view towards who may well uh, have a chance still to be called up or maybe not looking at some of the the late selections this week we're going to discuss uh, some other elements around the game as well ahead of Connacht taking on Cardiff in a week's time of course we're one week on for the Dragons victory four tries bonus point win what a win it was as well on the screen in front of me are our two guests William Davis how are you? Good evening Rob how are you? Good mm, Yes that sounds like the same tone you would have probably had after the Ireland Wales match on Sunday evening am I right? Yeah pretty close mm, mm. But yeah on the line as well, two weeks on from our last chat. Uh, Niall Shield, how are you these days? Not too bad, Rob. Not too bad. How are things? I was asking about the Ireland-Wales match, but you're never one to get too wrapped up in the international scene. You're, you like to keep it local here and focus on Connacht, although I'm sure you've watched the Six Nations and enjoyed it all the same. I did, yeah. I did, yeah. I did watch it. Yeah, you're probably right, though. I'm not as bothered about it as maybe I should be. Um, maybe something something will happen with selection that will get me more, more in, invested. <laughs> yeah, I know the feeling. Hey, do you know what I want to start with? It's just, again, because we, you know, we have our own perspective on things. William, you first. No, I'll j- dive in. But I was disappointed when I opened to some of the newspapers this week to see the kind of the main focus outside of the overall game. There was one paper that had a whole article on Billy Burns and his mistake. And I was sitting there going, if you're going to devote an article underneath the main article on the Ireland-Wales match to any individual player from that game who may have let down his country and it isn't Peter Romani. I- I'm a bit perplexed by that. Feel free to push back on me there William but I just felt it's a kind of a typical reaction to maybe the fact that he was an Ulster player and not necessarily a Leinster or a Munster player. <gasps> Controversial. I said it. I think it was probably to do with the fact that it was at the end of the game and he had certain things to do and he didn't do them. Whereas Peter O'Mahony's was a one-off incident quite early in the game, which did cost Ireland an awful lot. A lot felt, more. Yeah, I felt very sorry for Burns uh, in terms of it just went wrong from the minute he came on. And that mm-hmm. sometimes happens. He overkicked into touch. He threw a disastrous pass in midfield. He still had... It's a bit like the two Connacht failures against the Ospreys and Munster. They had... Ireland had a chance... Yeah, his kick to touch would not have won the game. There was a lot more had to happen, but if you don't get the initial bit of that right, yeah. it's not going to happen. And he he didn't get it right. He he went for too much distance. The kick drifted so far into the dead ball area, and that's very hard on him because he didn't want that to happen. So I can understand why it was being picked on a bit. Then it moved on to a discussion about. Uh, Johnny Sexton, which it inevitably does, because that's a never-ending discussion. And the Peter O'Mahony thing was a little bit lost in the middle of all this. And then yesterday, he got quite correctly, in my view, a three-match ban um, for a very stupid, ill-considered and dangerous play. And some of the stuff that's come out today about, oh, he doesn't owe an explanation to his teammates and he didn't mean it. I'm sorry, that's just that's just ludicrous. Uh, I don't care what he says to his teammates. I do, nobody else knows what he intended when he went into that scenario. Um, and the referee missed it the first time, and that's what TMOs are there for. So it was a, it was a very strange game because there was so much going on. Because in the middle of it, a 14 man Irish team really should have beaten a truly awful Welsh team. And some of the comments on the Welsh. Uh, fan sites were very blunt and very honest that Wales were Wales were terrible, but Ireland just couldn't at the end couldn't get the job done. Yeah, missed opportunity. Well, you took us on a bit of a journey there with that answer. I'll give you that. That's quite good. Uh, I'm going to still to strike back a little bit to to to, to drive home the point now, which I, I still think is. I mean, I agree with William 100%. It was a massive error from Burns, and it was quite a poor performance from Burns off the bench. Uh, and to be honest. I would obviously have rated maybe Byrne from Leinster or, of course, Jack Carty 
uh, as a better option and that's our perspective here so there so i looked at it and went yeah that's kind of what i feel billy is billy burns is capable of but at the same time of course he didn't want that to happen and of course he could uh, play a hell of a lot better so it just didn't happen for him but i did find it all that said a little bit striking that it just felt if he had been a Leinster player or a Munster player, maybe, maybe he wouldn't have been a lead lead article in the paper after a moment like that in the same context. Again, feel free to strike back if this seems seems very biased for me. I, I'm, go on, William. I, I just, I, the, well, I kind of get where you're coming from, but I think when a senior it's, player well, does something like that... The framing of it, William. Yeah, yeah, it's... But again, it's because he had the opportunity to get Ireland over the line. Mm. Peter O'Mahony's situation is totally different. It's just a moment of stupidity. Uh, mm. It's like a bad high tackle. Any player that gets sent off, and we've and Connacht have had a couple of send-ins off this year when something mm-hmm. stupid has happened. But it's it was just the end of the game, I think, scenario. But I agree with you. But Peter O'Mahony's a senior player, so maybe they get treated slightly differently by the media. So, uh, yeah, not to do with his province, perhaps. perhaps no, I think it's just the fact that he's, yeah. you know, he's captain the Lions in a in a test match, and he's a he's a very important part. I will say he had given away a very stupid penalty early in the game. He looked very fired up. I wonder was that partly to do with Paul O'Connell taking over as forwards coach? Did he want to show Paulie that this uh, I'm ready for business here? Well, sometimes players can go in and they can just be overwrought uh, and the next time he plays for Ireland which I assume he will again um, he will uh, he'll probably be a bit more circumspect No Yeah yeah. I get, I get what you're saying I get what you're saying I don't know I, I, I don't actually liken it to a high tackle because of the action that uh, he'd, it was rank stupidity absolute rank stupidity and Rob, to your point, then, you know, we it's amazing that we think that that you know he may be treated differently because he's um he's a certain player. You know, there's a there's an element sometimes with the new players if when they come in that they're they don't you know they don't get the chance, so it's easy to pillory them or whatever. I don't know, but it's just uh, I. I think, uh, you know, Omani, I I think he should have got a lot more than three games um, for what he did. Um, If they're going to be serious about um, what happens to to players like the axe and, you know, foul play like that, striking somebody in the head, you know, with your shoulder. um, uh, You know, I think that it should be an awful lot more good behavior and all that mentioned. That doesn't it doesn't mean anything. It's it's tacked on to the end of every um every press release from a disciplinary um decision. No, but uh, I don't know. It's it. It's just uh, for me. I, I have sympathy for Burns. Um, do you know it's only his fourth fourth game for Ireland, four caps. Mm. You know, um, and I know he's he's twenty whatever uh, age he is, and he should have made the kick or whatever. But he he'd obviously been playing poorly as well, um, but you know, big factor, big factor <laughs> yeah, in the mistake, yeah. I think as well. I think I think those. I mean, Gary Ringrose's break along the wing was fantastic, and uh, Jameson Gibson Park had a part to play in 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 kind of killing that move. But Billy Burns more so in terms of his moment, and I think those kind of elements came into. That last kick, I just think he just didn't feel in the groove, and that's been covered well in some uh, other good rugby podcasts out there. But here's a here's a wider point because it moves us towards where Ireland are right now. And the other big talking point of the week, William, was Johnny Sexton. So you kind of mentioned it already um, in terms of his performance, uh, but in terms of like it all comes down to his role in this Irish story, this management team's kind of linked to the past management team, and and. Maybe that the difficulty that even if they weren't linked to it, that you have when you're trying to bring in a new player. Sexton still has a lot to offer as a rugby player. We know that. We can see that. But we also would have thought by now that someone would have stood up. Um, what's your thoughts? And obviously it comes in a week where the French have taken the opportunity in some media outlets to kind of go after his concussion issues. Well, I thought that was a disgrace for any doctor to get involved in that. I mean, uh Johnny Sexton's medical history is between him and his 
personal doctors or the doctors in the IRFU who are looking after him. Uh, it is something that's discussed, but to come out as bluntly as that was, was very poor form. There is a succession issue for this position. Um, the problem is the guy who should probably be chasing hard and maybe already have the position is Paddy Jackson, who's playing now in London Irish. He was, I think, the nominated replacement for Johnny Sexton. That situation is, we all know what the issue is. He's not going to be picked by Ireland, and I doubt he'll ever play in Ireland again. Uh, and then you've got Joey Carberry at Munster, who has been permanently injured and is working very hard to get back. And I think those were the two that were nominated. So now you get the feeling that everybody else who's in line is really in about position four in terms of who they are. You've got Billy Burns, uh, Ross Byrne. You've got Billy Burns. You've got Jack Carty. Ben Healy's doing pretty well at Munster, but he's, he's very inexperienced and he hasn't been called up by Ireland yet. And it, it is just a real problem for them. And what's another issue is they've made him captain. So it's even harder to maybe turn around and say, we're now going to drop the captain. We're going to move on from this player and he's going to lose his position and the captaincy. Um, and I think they're going to have to make a decision fairly soon. Um, they're getting close. I mean, they've they've got about 23 or 24 matches left before the next World Cup, uh, not including the warm-up games immediately prior to the World Cup in September 2023. That is not a lot of rugby. It sounds a lot, but it isn't. At international level, high-intensity rugby, to bring two players through to cover this position, so you, they either believe that Johnny Sexton is going to continue for another two years or they don't. But even on the, the go forward, he didn't have a good game on Saturday or Sunday. He didn't play well against Wales. He's not, he doesn't look right. He's not played a lot of rugby. He looks out of sync. So how are you going to get him fit and ready to play going forward? Is he going to play... On Sunday against France, we don't know. The, the indications are he probably will. Then against Italy, is it a case of, right, we'll, we'll we'll put him on the bench and we'll try player, maybe Billy Burns gets a start, or maybe they go elsewhere. So it's very muddled thinking, and they have to, they have to tidy this up fairly quickly. Every discussion about Ireland starts, the first question, is Johnny Sexton playing? Is he fit? He carrying an injury, and that's been going on for two years, three years. And I would have thought that the management team would be getting tired of that. Exactly. And, you know, that's a key point now because we've had long discussions about the squad selection and there's about seven or eight players in that squad that fit into the category of what you were talking about last week. There wouldn't be Champions Cup first choice starters. And that's where in a conic perspective, we get a little bit annoyed just around the fringes. But I was looking at the 23, the last day, Niall, and it's not a whole far pile off what I would actually feel should be the 23. I need that needs to be stressed as well. It's not like there's seven or eight players took to the field the last day on the first 15, for example, and you were like, what are they doing in the squad? There's one or or two key positions that you're like, hmm, what's the thinking there? And it starts with the captain. It starts with the out half. It starts with his form, his game games uh, this season, for example, in terms of uh, the games in the legs, if you like. And all of that just doesn't kind of fit any sort of narrative that would, you know, give you a sense that they're trying to progress towards something long term, like William speaking of. Yeah, that's true. Um, he's just another Irish player that gets a chance to play himself back into form on the Irish team. You can't play yourself into form, but you can play yourself back into form. What I mean by that is, you is, if you're in the Irish squad already for a while, you get opportunity after opportunity after opportunity to get yourself right. So, do you know, in some ways, I hope Billy Burns, not in some ways, I do actually hope Billy Burns gets that opportunity to, you know, get himself back right and not be... Um, dropped, you know, um, unceremoniously, like we've seen with uh, Jack Carty be before. Uh, incidentally, I would have Jack Carty there all day long. Um, but, I, you know, I think you know my views on that um, anyway from the off. But the the issue with Sexton is everything that William has mentioned there. The fact that he's captain, how do you drop the captain? But Ireland make this rod for their own back. 
you know, Irish successive Irish coaches. Um, I've seen it said that uh, Ireland prioritised the Six Nations because that's where the money comes from. That money pays for seventy, it generates seventy five percent of the revenue that pays for rugby in Ireland. So, um, you know, the Six Nations is a huge driver in that. So that's why, you know, we don't get right until the next World Cup. As fans, we see the next World Cup as, you know, they have to get over that hump. They have to, you know, qualify for a semi-final, a final. But they're not going to do that continuing on the same vein. Um, I, it's not me that came up with this, but Liam Toland, I saw him on the, you know, he had he had put out a message on Twitter saying he, he just, he reamed off a whole host of uh, out halves. Um, and he, I, I can't remember the names. I might have them all wrong. I think he said Ben Healy, zero caps, Jack. Jack. Crowley, zero caps, uh, Harry Burns, zero caps, uh, Billy Burns, four caps, Ross Byrne, 11 caps, Jack Carty, 10 caps, and Johnny Sexton, 100 plus caps. There's your problem, like, there's there's your issue. You know, you, you don't make an international in two or three games. As far as I can see from watching it for years, you know, very few, only the very, very special player, you know, gets to that level. James Ryan is one... Um, you know, he's gotten to that level, but consequently he's dipped a touch now. Brian O'Driscoll did it. Um, but the, these fellas need games. And we had a we had a cup for nothing in autumn. And, you know, they didn't use that to get these, to give these fellas the game time they needed. That was baffling. That was baffling. Well, it is. And if you put all your eggs, if you say, like you were saying, William, if you say, uh, well, they had Paddy Jackson and Joey Carberry named as two or three. Well, that didn't happen. So you have to have another plan. You can't put your, you know... You, you constantly have to have that plan. It's, you know, a really attritional sport. You don't know when a player is going to, um, when his career is going to be cut short, especially in that position. It's just, it's really poor planning. It's, and that's one of the things I struggle to understand about rugby in Ireland and then how players uh, are brought forward or put forward by by whomever. I, I just can cannot understand it. I kind, of, I kind of think the, the autumn internationals were, were, were missed by everybody, except maybe for France, who had to, in the end, play a lot of play, younger players because their players couldn't be released for the last game, which is part of the reason that France is just different in the way they approach things. And then they still nearly won it. Um, but w- Wales have been guilty of it. Scotland maybe don't have enough players. I think coaches are inclined to see what's in front of them. It's very hard for them at that level, to be thinking a long way down the road. Uh, they should be, but when the pressure is on, look at Wayne Pivak at Wales. That that game maybe, did it save his career on Sunday? Well, it certainly helped give him a little bit more breathing space because the pressure he was under was immense. They'd beaten Italy twice in Georgia out of 10 games. That's, that's, not, that's not getting to the level that's needed. So the... the, the You've got to, I think you've got to look at the game that's in front of you, where the whole team unit is. But it's pretty obvious that when you have, a, as you've just said, you've got a player with 100 caps and nobody else with any caps, then you've got a problem. And you're absolutely right. You don't turn an international player in two or three games. Some players come in and look brilliant and then slip. Some players come in and look dreadful, but you give them a chance. But it's hard because, as I've just said, there's only 24 games left to the next World Cup. I mean, that's... That's just a season for a club side. But as an international coach, he's only got that amount of space. But there, it seems it just looks so muddled at the moment. And it's it must be affecting the cohesiveness of the squad. They keeps The more they tell you it isn't, the more you think, yeah, it probably is. Yeah, fact. It's funny, uh, you're talking about Wayne Pivak, trying to follow Warren Gatland, you know, and obviously the Gatland regime. It ain't easy. And we know what that was like in Connacht many, many years ago. Glenn Ross will tell a story about that. But like, it is it is that kind of legacy that they've left and the standards that they have set. So, I mean, geez, the pictures of Wayne Pivak watching the game were the pictures of what you'd absolutely kind of summed up a manager. Who said, even like even the COVID protocols only made him look more isolated than he was. <laughs> nearly oh, just, just. Yeah. Oh my God! He looked. He well, may as well have been sitting in the back row of the upper tier behind the goal on his own. Like. What, what what he must have been thinking when Gareth Davis kicked that ball away with about twenty seconds to go? I'd say his life was flashing before him because you still didn't think that Ireland, but you sort of knew that it, it's funny how the psychology of these things works. Wales fell apart immediately. That happened. Total 
utter chaos. Yeah. yeah. And Ireland got a free hit. Let's throw it around a bit. They get a stupid penalty. They kick. And that's... That's why coaches I actually thought, are great. I actually thought, like, it's the arrogance that we Irish rugby people have watching a games against Wales. The outrageous arrogance, because it's it is like this pure. There's no places for it. The amount of times Wales beat us, but you're just there going, oh, we have them, <laughs> we have them. They're falling apart. But yet again, we didn't have them. The amount of times we feel that. But yeah, no, that's that's quite a good, accurate kind of portrayal of it. lads. I just want to ask you. Here's just a random aside. There was a couple additions to the squad this week, and I want to ask you, William, because we know how Nile feels about this. But Ed Byrne, a loose prop, was called in, and Ryan Bear was called in as well and I mean Alan was only telling us before the game the last day Niall Murray started for Connacht the last day and Niall Murray was the man who kept Ryan Baird out of the Irish under 20s obviously things have moved on and he's a superb player from Leinster but Gavin Thornbury mother have they not watched Gavin Thornbury play a rookie match William I mean wow how can he not be called in I I, I don't know that's that's the real bafflement I mean Gavin Thornbury's been playing the best rugby of his career He's a monster in the line-out. He, now, the Welsh line-out was very poor, so Ireland were able to terrorise it. But Gavin Thornbury is the sort of guy who would be able to terrorise a very good French line-out. It's decisions like that that do leave you gasping a little bit. Mm. And they they don't explain them, which is fair enough, because they can't come along and say, well, this is why we've picked so-and-so. It's a, it, it is a bit frustrating. He's He must be very, very close to that scenario. Yeah. No, I, like, I know how you feel, but like it, it is important that we keep, we don't just give up saying this. It's important that we don't, within our own coverage of the game out West, just allow this to become just a uh, fait accompli and shrug our shoulders. We should be exasperated every time a decision like that happens in the background. Yeah, I'd, I'd love to know, and I don't, I don't mean uh, to ask any friend what, why, what are his thoughts and why, I, and I, I don't mean this in so far as does he think Gavin Thornbury has played really well. He should be in an Irish squad. You know, I wouldn't, I wouldn't like to say that. But I'd love to ask him, um, you know, how is it for you guys trying to offer a new contract to somebody who's playing possibly the best rugby he has, who's maybe been told, you know, um, certain things when it comes to offering somebody a new contract versus them going to England or France or wherever for Japan for Megabucks. Like how 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 can a coach from Connacht say to somebody, you know, we'll progress your career here? I I, I just and it deserves an explanation. No, maybe they've got it in private. I'm, I'm sure. Jesus, how could they tell, you know, the likes of us over the airwaves? Well, you know, they told us this, they told us that. I I'm that's something that really 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 baffles me. And you know, you Ireland will never be strong enough if they keep continuing in the same vein that they're doing they're doing things. And that goes for out half and loose head prop and every other position. I, th- I, I, think, I think one of the things, Rob, that we're not sure of, they obviously, they judge players, I think, on how they perform, first of all, in the interprovincials and then Europe. Those are the main chances that you have to impress. We see the players in a lot of Pro 14 action as mm. well. Uh, you wonder how much that's looked at. Yeah. It's and when you get a new management structure, you're gonna get different ways of doing things. I mean, Joe Schmidt, it was well known, contacted players who probably had very little chance of playing for Ireland, but he kept up a constant conversation uh around what they were doing. Is that still occurring? I mean, he was a, he was a rugby obsessive and he would ring up, allegedly he would ring up players and say, how are you doing? Blah, blah, blah. Why did you do this in the 23rd minute for Connacht against the Dragons? Why did you do this? Why did you go left instead of right? Or why didn't you kick? Or uh, and That was his modus operandi. Um and I think it's easy. I mean, he would have had to make a lot of phone calls after the last three minutes against Munster, but carry on. <laughs> yeah, the, the, th- the thing about it is, when the game, uh, when he when he was doing that, Ireland were very successful. Ireland were nominally the number one side in the world. They were winning a lot of rugby matches. They were going to Australia and winning. They were beating New Zealand. It's probably a hell of a lot harder to be doing that when you're actually trying to make sure that you get a win against that awful game against Georgia back in November where they looked like a side that was like rabbits in the headlights. So it's, there's a lot going on there, but it must be difficult. 
to say to players, your contract's up for renewal. We we want you to stay at Connacht, but we really don't know if you have a future with Ireland. Um, do you want to stay and try to make that future happen? And it mightn't happen. Or does a player think, do you know what? It's time for me to go and do something else in rugby, a new challenge. There's a lot of players out of contract. A lot of our international players are out of contract. This must be difficult times for the management in Connacht because they're just they're negotiating as best they can. It's been a very difficult year and it started very late. So, yeah, the timing is off. Alan had a stat, didn't he, in the commentary? And correct me if I'm wrong, or maybe he'll correct it on the editor. Just leave it in, Alan. I'm sorry if I'm wrong. We'll correct it again. But I think he said 2014 was the last time Connick didn't have a player in an Irish uh, Six Nations squad, uh, match day that, squad. That, is that it? Said. And that's stunning. Well, it's awful bad timing, isn't it? When we're in such a... Cr- it's probably the biggest contract period in 10 years that Connick have had to deal with. Yeah, because and you now have international happened. players whose contracts are up, whereas a few years ago we didn't have that many players. I mean, nobody has talked about the fact that Bundy Aki is where is he now in terms of Ireland? He didn't get a start against uh, Wales. He is not a player that I see Ireland using off the bench because he doesn't cover a number of positions. Although I'd like to see Jordan Larmer starting against France because I think he brings something. But he seems to be there because he can cover fullback and wing and you could probably stick him in the centre at a push. But I'd like to see him start and find somebody else for the bench. Um, so, so, Controversially, so, I would actually prefer him than Ringrose after what I saw the last day. And I know there was a lot of good reviews over Ringrose. And rightly so, that break at the end was sensational. He's a wonderful player. But I, I still saw the mistakes that Ringrose made, the poor kick in the first half, the mistake in the lead to the North try. And I just felt... I, there's something about the Aki Henshaw combination that I, I prefer, but obviously we go back to a time when those two were leading Connacht. Yeah, it's, it's, it's an interesting one. I think there there might be a feeling that they're more creative with ring rules. Um, Bundy's not the greatest kicker either, which is an unusual thing because it, it is handy if your centre can. So it's it, there's so much sort of tied up with this. Um, you know, the, the other issue that's up for discussion at the moment with Connacht is bringing players in. There's a report that. And I, I'm only going on what I've read, that they made a serious effort to get David Hawkshaw from Leinster and he's turned Connacht down. And Connacht have been turned down lots of times before. It happens when this is going on. But there are some issues here. Connacht, if you're trying to get players to come from other Irish provinces, uh, Connacht don't win enough interprovincials. They don't do well enough in Europe. And let's be blunt about this. They're training in a park because they have to go to Kappa Park to use the 4G pitch there because they haven't got one. And I think some players buy in to some of the things that you have to put up with at Connacht, that maybe the facilities aren't, they're good, but they're not as good as they are in other places. Uh, The stadium itself is unique. We love it, but it needs updating. So there's there's that as well. And and young players might just go, nah, I don't, don't fancy that. Or you get some of the younger players. One who stands out to me is a player like Paul Boyle, who the minute he arrived seems to fall in love with the whole ethos yeah. of Connacht. Yeah. Pulls on his Look green at the jersey. feeling of Gavin Thornbury and Alex Wootton and a few players like that. Maybe yeah. In Alex Wootton's case, he's on loan, so it's probably easier for him to just buy in for a year and we'll see if he does in the long term. He may well. John Porch, but that's a different story. We're talking about players within within the Irish uh, setup for now. Yeah. Uh, and here's the other thing. And, and William, if you don't mind if you jump in, and I'll link to you on this night. Like, I do think sometimes we we hear the stories of the Warren Gatlin era in the 90s and we're like, oh my God, Connacht in those days were this, that and the other. And, and you know, you ran out the back of the old sports ground and yada, yada, yada. But sometimes we forget that that's then and this is now and now is now and five years time. Will they look back at Kappa Park and will there be stories of, oh yeah, that was the point where, you know, I realized Connacht weren't going to get this stadium built. And do you know what I'm saying? Sometimes we think we've made it because we won a title. We've made it because we signed Bundyaki and re-signed him. But you have to be constantly evolving, don't you, to keep up? Oh, yeah. yeah of course you do. Um, and I don't know. Uh, I think there, there's all sorts there's all sorts of kites being flown in the press about uh, about player movement um, over the years. And there still is, again, this year. And um, an amazing kite flown by um, the journalists in the Irish Independent about um, the uh, academy setup. So... Uh, 
I can I can I can see what you're saying about Connacht not having all the I mean Leinster famously their their sub academy has its own setup like a complete set up their own you know they train out at Donnybrook um they're a, a gym that was paid for by some you know some and the philanthropist I suppose I don't know so we don't have the access to that but what Connacht do have access to is to give people game time and I don't I hope that that's enough for players I mean the you know the the stuff is in place for the um, for the sports ground for the development and that includes training and whatever else. But William, I think you're right. Like there's there isn't enough of enough good things there when it comes to a setup for Connacht. No, maybe when you're in the middle of it, you don't notice it as much when you're tra- when you're playing and all that. But maybe when you go somewhere else, you um, you see that. Like or maybe when you come from somewhere else, you might see that. I think I think it's a challenge. I mean, somebody I was talking to in Wales. Uh, a couple of weeks ago, put it to me that the biggest problem that he sees with younger players at the moment is the first isn't isn't who's coaching them, or isn't their skills coach, or their fitness coach, or their training coach. It's their agent. Is what is their agent telling them? Um, and that that's a huge issue. The players get their heads turned very easily, and they get some of them get very good advice, and some of them get very shaky advice. And of course, parents are involved in that as well. And I agree with Niall. The biggest thing that you can give in Connacht is game time. They get game time. Um, and and is that what they want, or do they want to be part of? They're 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 evolving in a group. And Leinster is the one that everybody looks at because they have the most players. And that's not their fault. And it's not their fault that they have the best setup and the best system. But if you can't get playing. Your career can run out of space very, very quickly. If you're 29 or 30, missing the odd game here or there is probably good for you to, to give you some longevity. But when you're 22, 23, surely you want to play as often as you can because that's that's how you learn about yourself and the game. Yeah, listen, lads, this discussion has been class. It's been really interesting to just kind of, like we're opening the door into a wider conversation there. And I, and I think it's probably, we've kicked it around for a while uh, behind scenes at the next down week for Connacht, I think there's one in about four weeks. Um, maybe in a post kind of Six Nation environment or later into the Six Nations, it would be worth kind of delving back into a, a decentralized academy idea that you kind of hinted at there. And uh, you know, I, I like you know where I'm going to go with this, which I've always believed that there should be a certain element of what they do in American sports as well, because Ireland has a position to do that, where you can have a draft system. Um, or at the very least, you know, it doesn't have to be some sort of fancy kind of public draft, but there should be an element of, as these guys graduate, the teams that, you know, get first pick and need, need, need you know, can prove that they need a person in that position, get access to those players. I, like, I don't see any any logic to doing it any differently, but obviously a lot of people in, in other provinces would see plenty of reason why that's not going to work. Well, they do, but it's all, you know, the the people with the biggest objections to this are the, you know, are the provinces that have everything laid on for them. Like, uh, I, I've seen it used that they, uh, when Australia went down the, you know, the route of that, that the um, rugby union um, went into severe decline. But, you know, uh, you know, of, for players moving, uh, their prov- province, we'll call it, or whatever super rugby squad you're going to call it down there. But, you know... Two of the three most successful um, rugby unions in the world, uh, players do that all the time in in South Africa and New Zealand. They really do, do you know? Um, and I just you know, and the the if they're if the Irish national team generates th- two three quarters or or even more of um, the revenue for paying for rugby in Ireland, well then they're going to have to do something to increase the player pool to the proper you know to the acceptable levels that they're going to need instead of like i said before using second third and fourth choice players from a province in the irish squad ireland at the moment look to me like i said as a glorified club team where you come back you play players back into form from there and i i don't i don't think it's right i don't think it's good enough do you know if they want rugby to go i like in, yeah if they want rugby to go into the that popular level well then, you know they're going to have to they're going to have to do something about it. 
I had a conversation with Danny uh, about this uh, off air on another moment. And look, he just made the point that like, and the proof's in the pudding. We're not successful in the World Cup. We have not got past the quarterfinal, you know. And, you know, William, you're a Six Nations lover, but we've probably underperformed in the Six Nations to what the talent has been there as well. Oh, yeah, completely. Um, I think it's a very tough tournament. We saw what happened to England. Um, France were very impressive against Italy. It'd be very interesting to see Dublin on Sunday might be a completely different setup for them. But I mean, they look world world beating in that game. But they were only playing Italy, so it it has that all going on. England today have had to go backwards. George Ford's back. What a surprise! At ten, Farrell's mm-hmm. gone into the centre last week. That was, an, uh, you know, that that shows you the pressure a coach like Eddie Jones, who took a team to a World Cup final, is under. He's had to basically say, I got that wrong. Didn't work. Um, but we have. It, it, it's Ireland should have and could have done better. And they blew it last Sunday, if you want to be honest. They, that was a game they should have won. So it, that, that does lead to maybe a bit of inertia with selection. But I agree uh, with Niall that you, you have to increase the player pool at that level. And maybe what isn't being understood is that the gap between even Champions Cup rugby and international rugby, there is still a step up needed there. Mm. Uh, And it may be a physical step up or a mental step up. And maybe that's something that increases when you have more players pushing for positions. So it's in the hands of the IRFU. They control this. They pull the purse strings. Uh, and I think they're very well aware that they are concerned that there are players not getting the game time that's that's required at the highest level. Sitting on the bench for games or getting the odd Pro 14 start, that's not really going to cut it uh, when you're when you're expected to go out and take on the likes of Wales or France or England at the end of the Six Nations or Scotland with their rejuvenated side. So knowing it and actually fixing it or two different things. Connacht, you're back uh, next week. So we'll have a preview podcast. Uh, they're back on track now. We didn't get to talk to you. Uh, so we're going to have a final talk from each of you, but I just want to quickly give each of you one shot at uh, your feelings on where Connacht stand right now. As our listeners listen to this, the Eagles would probably have played and we'll have a little feature on that. The Eagles versus Munster. Uh, William's going to be at that game. I think Lindley's at the game and Dave as well. William, you can give me a nod there from right. Is that the right? And Alan. Yes, thank you. And Alan, oh, right. Should we get a little podcast uh, feature there into the preview show next week? But yeah, overall, how are you feeling after the Dragons victory, the bonus point win? You know, some great tries. And obviously some uh, some issues defensively when it comes to them all. Yeah, still there, still there. Um, they mustn't be getting the opportunity to to work to work on that. I know there's issues over how teams um, how teams are setting up for the for the. Oh ball. yeah, that dragons that dragon setup did look fairly illegal, but it's it's a consistent problem across multiple games from a conduct perspective. Yeah, yeah, you you know I don't know you'd wonder why it's not being looked at. Uh, you'd wonder why the you know the. The referees themselves aren't being; um, they don't seem to be uh, be looked 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 at after it. Um, so that that is a problem uh, with the the Pro 14 for Connacht anyway. Um, yeah, some great great stuff, some great kicking out of Jack again. Um, when the game needed to be won, you know, Slotty's drop goal, beautiful line kicking again. Um, sorry, I know I keep going on about there, but there I can't conceive. That he shouldn't be in, you know, that he shouldn't be in the Irish squad at the minute. I just, I just can't conceive it. Here, here. I, I, I just can't. When you see that he can do that, that kind of thing, um, I'll, you know, there's a few question marks over his goal kicking at the minute. But I just, I just think, um, you know, uh, for what everything else he brings, um, I think it's worth keeping him in the squad. Anyway, that's the last time I'm going to say that. Um, but for Connacht themselves, I'm really worried about the contract situations. We, you know, I've not heard anything on that, and that's something that that bothers me, especially over, um, you know, what's happening with the Irish squad now and all of that. We've, you know, we've twenty seven guys are out of contract, um, and yet there's nothing from the kind of branch. And equally, as I, I'm kind of annoyed that the Eagles match isn't going to be streamed live streamed tomorrow. 
I can't get that. Can't oh, yeah, that was going to be your final uh, thought, yeah. I suppose it was, yeah. I, I just, I can't understand it. I, you know, why Why not do that? It's not just Connor fans, like Munster fans are on to see it and every rugby anorak would want to see it as well because you get to see, um, you know, fringe players and all this kind of thing. I, I don't know. Um, what's important here is, you know, is it important to get the the brand out there that people can see them play? That's, I don't know. It's just, I'm... Um, you know. Especially, and the point is, now just to, just to say the unsaid there, what you're trying to uh, is is we can't go to games for COVID yeah. protocols. Exactly. The, the nation exactly. is shut down. We're being asked to stay in our homes, and rugby has been giving this special privilege as a, an organisation that lifts the spirits of a nation mm. to play games. So yeah. the, I, I think there's an onus really on them to, in that sense. But hey, well, exactly, exactly. It's very disappointing. Uh, just you know, and um, I think shame on the Connor branch for this because it is very disappointing. Um, but yeah, that's enough, I think. <laughs> we'll uh, we'll uh, push to William there on the final thought. William, one thing from something earlier if that was said there by Niall, which is just on the contract situation. You've your ear to the ground. Can we expect any big announcements this week? Do you think? Well, it's uh, Friday as people listen to this. Next week. <laughs> yeah, look, these things are always choreographed, and they they I suppose whether they. Whether they're allowed to put out that sort of stuff around Six Nations week, I don't know. Whether they want next week is next week is a Pro 14 week. They have a game against Cardiff. I would like to hear something um, because the list is there and there are some very big names on it. And I think for Andy Friend going forward, I mean, his he's now into a two-year cycle of his next coaching cycle. So he needs these players there. He doesn't want to be starting again from scratch. He needs to be bringing as many of these players through that he wants so that they can they can get ready for next season, which seems a long way off. But that, you know, finish this season, next season will arrive fairly quickly and hopefully with better times for us in ter- terms of people going to watch games. Connacht are in an OK place. They haven't won enough games, is my concern. I thought they were, they did well against that Dragons team on that rotten pitch and their game is being called off now tomorrow night against uh, Edinburgh because the pitch is now frozen. So it just mm. must be ridges of frozen mud. Um, Cardiff game is huge. Uh, they're going to have lost a few more players to the Welsh squad. Uh, but Dai Young is back. He's a wily old campaigner. Good that was probably... Oh, he's a great... I think he's a great coach and I think he knows... He knows what he's at. They beat Connacht in that game that played at Rodney Parade earlier in the season. Probably Connacht's worst away performance of the season, really. It was it was a very insipid effort that night. I think they'll be an awful lot better. But look, they got to win that game uh, Saturday week. Uh, it's an eight point, ten point game if you count bonus points because Cardiff are right on our heels, and they've got to bring what they did against the Dragons. Bring it. F- bring it into that game, be more clinical, and certainly uh, Cardiff will give the drive in Mall a go because every side's doing it now. So Yeah, <laughs> and whatever technical I- issue uh, around the way to protect the guy coming down that you can't sack the, the line out catcher, you're just going to have to find a way around it because the referees aren't going to probably help them out at this stage. Well, that's 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 an interesting challenge, but it it'll be a fa- it'll be another fascinating game on a when the we we go back to from the international back to the more the more local level. Alan will be back to present that show as we preview uh, the week ahead. William will be at the press conference, and he's hoping he's hoping that there might be a few contract announcements in there. Niall Shield, you are uh, a great man for your time. Thank you very much. You're very welcome, man. You're very welcome. Yeah, and we'll uh, look forward to the weekend. And uh, not, and William Davis, thanks a million. Good night, lads. Good to talk to you. Loose, cut it loose. Break out or nothing changes. Side.